Good morning. Welcome to this session of the 2020 Postal History Symposium, sponsored by the American Philatelic Society, the American Philatelic Research Library, the Smithsonian's National Postal Museum, and this year by the United States Philatelic Classic Society. I am Scott Tiffany, Librarian and Director of Information Services at the American Philatelic Research Library. Our presenter for this session will be Ken Lawrence, and the title of his presentation is Navassa Island, the Original Overseas United States Possession, 1876 to 1898. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Ken Lawrence. Ken has been a philatelic writer and researcher for more than 35 years, an antebellum and Civil War era historian for 50 years, and a stamp and cover collector for more than 65 years. In 2004, the United States Philatelic Classic Society honored him with its Distinguished Philatelist Award. He served six years as editor of the Philatelic Communicator, a quarterly journal of the APS Philatelic Writers Unit number 30. He had a regular column in the American Philatelist until 1999 and a regular monthly column in the Scott Stamp Monthly. He has published numerous articles in, the most, in most of the major U.S. philatelic publications, including three submissions to the American Philatelic Congress book, and in more than 20 stamp specialty publications worldwide. For seven years, he wrote the stamps and stamp collecting articles that appeared in two major encyclopedia yearbooks. For these and other contributions as a philatelic author, editor, and contributor, he was elected to the APS Writers Hall of Fame in 1998. Ken now writes monthly Spotlight on Philately columns and Covering the World features for Lynn's Stamp News. He has published articles about Navassa Island, its history and postal history in Lynn's Stamp News and the Classic Society's journal, The Chronicle. After two decades as a nationally and internationally accredited philatelic and literature judge, Ken retired to emeritus status. He is co-author with Scott R. Chuppel of the book, Rarity Revealed, the Benjamin K. Miller Collection, published by the Smithsonian's National Postal Museum in 2006. He has also edited and co-authored the book, The Liberty Series, published by the American Philatelic Society in 2007. For his philatelic writing, Ken has won numerous awards, among them the Earl B. Affelbaum, Award twice for Best American Phil Philatelist Article and the American First Day Cover Society's Philip H. Ward Jr. Award twice for Best First Day Cover Article. Most recently, Ken was awarded the 2019 U.S. Stamp Society's Barbara Mueller Award for his article, What Items Franked with 1913 Parcel Post Stamps Are Authentic First Day Covers which appeared in the August 2019 issue of the American Philatelist. With that, it is my distinct honor on behalf of the 2020 Postal History Symposium to present Ken Lawrence and his presentation titled, Navassa Island, the Original Overseas United States Possession, 1876 to 1898. Good morning. Thank you for attending my presentation. This is a new procedure for me. You real-time online viewers and listeners are, in effect, my first focus group. Thanks also to the American Philatelic Society, the American Philatelic Research Library, the Smithsonian National Postal Museum, and the United States Philatelic Classic Society for sponsoring and hosting this 11th Postal History Symposium. Besides the sponsors, the APS Translation Service provided essential help for this presentation. The theme of our 2020 symposium is postal innovation of the classic era. The Classic Society defines the classic era as the period up to and including the 1894 to 1902 first bureau issue of United States stamps. My subject is the mails of Navassa Island from 1876 to 1898. Navassa Island mails probably began earlier, 
possibly when guano mining began in the 1850s and 1860s, but the earliest documented mail is from 1876. Navassa Island mails ended with the evacuation of Americans from Navassa when the war with Spain began in 1898 and did not resume until the second or third decade of the 20th century. Not every postal innovation was successful, and even some that were successful proved to be only temporary. So it was with the males of Navassa Island, which means that surviving covers are rare. Navassa Island lies between Jamaica and Haiti, south of Cuba in the Caribbean Sea. An American ship captain claimed it under the 1856 Guano Islands Act. The State Department officially recognized his claim in 1859. Navassa has remained a United States possession ever since. Before moving to a discussion of the postal history, let me begin with the prehistory and history of the island itself and how it came to be the first overseas United States possession. Geological evidence confirms that Navassa was once inhabited by Taino people indigenous to Haiti. In the 19th century, Dr. Christopher Galliard of Jamaica excavated these circa 1200 AD pottery sherds. He found the ones numbered Roman numeral five and Roman numeral seven at Navassa. I copied this plate from the story of the life of Columbus and the discovery of Jamaica by Frank Kundle and published by the Institute of Jamaica in 1894. By the time Europeans arrived, Navassa had no resident population, but it was a source of edible shellfish and a refuge from rough seas for mariners who sailed among the Antilles and for transient visitors in small boats from nearby Hispaniola. A study of Navassa Island history with Hernando Colon's book rendered in English as The Life of Admiral Christopher Columbus by his son Ferdinand, volume two. He wrote it in Spanish, probably from about 1536 to 1539, possibly earlier. The original has been lost except for fragments copied by Bartolomé de las Casas. The version that historians use today has descended from a 1571 Italian translation by Alfonso de Ulloa. I copied this excerpt from an edition that was restored and to the extent possible corrected to the original Spanish published in Madrid in 1892. In June and July of 1504, on his fourth voyage to the Americas, Christopher Columbus found himself and his crew shipwrecked at Port Santa Gloria, today known as St. Anne's Bay, on the northern coast of Jamaica, without a seaworthy vessel to take them home to Spain. He dispatched one of his captains, Diego Mendes, to obtain a caravel from Nicolas de Ovando, the Spanish governor of Hispaniola. Mendes and his party of six Spaniards and 10 Indians launched forth on the broad bosom of the sea in canoes. With no wind to propel them, members of the crew took turns rowing all day and all night. By the second day, they had nearly exhausted their supply of drinking water. The Indians had advised the Spaniards that a small island lay ahead about eight leagues distant from Hispaniola. Here they would find water to assuage their thirst and would be able to take repose. <clears throat> but another day of rowing passed without sighting land. One of the Indians died of the accumulated sufferings of labor, heat, and raging thirst. Others lay gasping at the bottom of their canoes. Late that second night, Mendes perceived that the moon was emerging from behind a dark mass elevated above the ocean. Otherwise, he would not have seen it. The next morning, he and his companions found themselves on the island that was called Nawasa, which was eight leagues from Hispaniola, where they rested and quenched their thirst. Like other researchers before me, I thought the, that Spaniards had named the island, 
But now I am convinced that Nawasa in Ferdinand Columbus's narrative was the name Mendes had learned from his Indian guides. Piece of Nawasa Island history and postal history. Flemish cartographer Cornelis Fifleet produced the first atlas of the Americas in the year 1597. It consisted of 19 copper plate prints, including this one. He titled his atlas in Latin, Descriptionis Ptolemaicae Augmentum, which means supplement to Claudius Ptolemy's Geographica, Geography, Description of the World. Johannes Bogardus printed it in Leuven, Habsburg, Netherlands. Fleet knew about Navassa. 17th century, the letters U and V were interchangeable in Romance languages. After I realized that, my searches for N-A-U-A-Z-A revealed that nearly all the early European mariners who visited the New World and the historians who recorded their travels knew of and wrote about Nawasa. This passage is from the 1556 book, The General and Natural History of the West Indies by Gonzalo Fernando de Oviedo. Richard Hockloyd's 1589 book, the Principal Navigations, Voyages, Traffics, and Discoveries of the English Nation, Volume 4. This one is from, from Samuel Purchase's 1626 book, Purchase His Pilgrimage. He was not a mariner himself, but he collected the personal narratives of sailors and published them. As years passed, the name Nawasa evolved into La Navas, in French, and Nevassa Island in English. It became the Guano Islands Act, adopted by Congress on August 16, and signed by Fre President Franklin Pierce two days later. The law provided that when any citizen or citizens of the United States may have discovered, or shall hereafter discover, a deposit of guano on any island, rock, or key, not within the lawful jurisdiction of any other government, and shall take possession thereof and occupy the same said island, rock, or key, may, at the discretion of the President of the United States, be considered as appertaining to the United States. The Legal Advisor's Office of the State Department later wrote, the use of the term appertain is deft, since it carries no exact meaning, and lends itself readily to circumstance and the wishes of those using it. On November 18, 1857, American Sea Captain Peter Duncan of Baltimore declared in a sworn statement before a commissioner of the United States Circuit Court for the District of Maryland that he had discovered guano on Navassa Island on J July 1 and that he had exercised his right to claim it on the authority of the Guano Act. Duncan assigned his rights to another Baltimore mariner, Captain Edward Kernan Cooper, retaining for himself the contract to transport guano passengers and mail between Nevassa, Baltimore, Wil Wilmington, North Carolina, New York City, and occasional other ports on his brig Romance. Cooper persuaded Governor Thomas Watkins Ligon to lease several scores of prisoners confined in the Maryland penitentiary as laborers to mine the guano. This wood engraving from the March 15, 1868 issue of the French newspaper L'Univers Illustré pictures the guano mining, processing, and loading complex on Navassa Island. In the foreground is the inlet called Lulu Bay, where crews loaded guano onto small boats, rode them out beyond the surrounding reef, and transferred the cargo to large sailing vessels for shipment to the United States. The owner docked at Lulu Bay, the largest vessel that the shore could accommodate. On December 8, 1859, to forestall a Haitian attempt to take possession of Navassa, U.S. Secretary of State Louis Cass 
certified Duncan and Cooper's claim. Theirs was the third claim to be filed under the Guano Act, not the first, but it was the first to be certified by the Secretary of State acting on behalf of the president, completing the process mandated by the act, and has remained under United States jurisdiction ever since. Navassa Island is thus the original overseas possession of the United States, held for the longest continuous period. Cass should not have certified the claim to Navassa. The island is located within the coastal waters of Haiti and is visible from the Haitian mainland. Its original inhabitants were Taino people from Hispaniola. For more than two centuries, Haitian fishermen who considered Navassa part of their country had landed there to harvest shellfish. Each of Haiti's constitutions since 1801 had declared its sovereignty over named and unnamed adjacent islands. But before the Civil War, the United States did not recognize the government of Haiti, formerly the French colony of Saint-Domingue. American slave owners, their supporters, and their representatives in Washington, including President James Buchanan, regarded the example of a victorious slave revolution and emancipation on a nearby Caribbean island as an existential threat to their way of life. In his 1956 book, Advance Agents of American Destiny, diplomatic historian Roy F. Nichols wrote, in this humble fashion, the American nation took its first step into the path of imperialism. Navassa, a guano island, was the first non-contiguous territory to be announced formally as attached to the Republic. This document explicitly connected to Navassa Island is this December 3, 1866 identity paper of an African-American seaman named Daniel Smith, who had served on the bark Sylph from New York to Jamaica to Navassa to Baltimore. Sylph's captain, R.M. Harriman, had put Smith ashore at Baltimore because he was too ill for the trip north from Baltimore to Boston, which saved Smith's life. Sylph and her entire crew were lost in a gale off the Massachusetts coast. One of the products advertised on this 1869 fertilizer dealer's circular was, it was Navassa Guano. The stamp is a two cent Andrew Jackson blackjack adhesive with F grill. Lady's postal card from a Baltimore guano merchant pictures one of the large square rigged barks that brought guano from Navassa. This Navassa Guano Company advertising trade card from the 1880s, distributed by an Augusta, Georgia cotton factor is another relic of the era when guano from Navassa Island brought wealth and prosperity to Southern agriculture. Guano from Navassa Island to the American East Coast port cities also brought letters. The 1879 edition of Postal Laws and Regulations of the United States listed Navassa Island as an origin and destination of US mail for the first time. This cover to Warren, Maine, owned by Scott Treppel, is the earliest in my census of five that have been collected. The enclosed letter, dated October 6, 1880, tells a sad story. Scott published a transcript in the February 2017 Chronicle. Navassa Island, West Indies, October 6, 1880. Mrs. John Cutting, Warren, Maine, USA. Dear Aunt Lucinda, I will address you a few lines to let you know of my whereabouts. I hope this will find you well and also your husband. I am loading here with guano for Baltimore and will sail in a day or two. This is a very lonesome place. Only 18 white men and 230 Negroes is all the people that is here not a woman to be seen on the island. I came here from Jamaica. I no doubt you have heard of the great hurricane there on the 18th of August. I was in it. All the shipping was lost, 
but another bark and mine. I had a life jacket on all night, expecting every moment that my ship would be on the rocks. I stood on deck all night in the storm, and at times the sea was breaking over us. I tell you, I was a glad boy when morning came and the storm was over and all aboard were safe. I have to send this letter as a ship letter and cannot pay any postage here for there is no post office. And the only way to send a letter is by a passing vessel, C.A. Pascal. Pascal's bark, Rosetta McNeil, loaded with guano, arrived at Baltimore on November 5, four days after his letter to his aunt was postmarked at the Wilmington, North Carolina post office. The ship had survived one of the worst hurricanes in Jamaican history, but was lost at sea two years later. The problem was to explain the postal rate. Year dated as 1880 by the enclosure, when the domestic letter rate was three cents per half ounce, the ship letter rate was six cents, double the domestic letter rate. Why was eight cents postage due, charged, and paid? Treppel and postal historians James Baird, Tony Crumbly, and Richard Winter guessed that the post offices at Wilmington and Warren had erroneously added the two cent fee that was owed to the ship captain, which was included in the ship letter rate. Patricia Stilwell Walker identified the advertising inscription on the envelope as Sidney D. Jenkins, ship broker, commission exporter and company, R. Cardiff, whose rate needs to be explained. Postal markings show that it arrived at Baltimore on December 19, 1884. It had transited Covington, Kentucky on December 24 and was advertised January 24, 1885 at Mount Sterling. Somewhere along the, lay, the way, it was rated three cents postage due. But one infers from the tied two cent postage due stamp that only that amount was collected from the recipient. In the four years since Scott Treppel's hurricane letter had been mailed, the domestic letter rate had been reduced to two cents per half ounce, effective October 1, 1883. It would be further reduced to two cents per ounce on July 1, 1885. In the August 1990 Chronicle, postage due experts Warren Bauer and George Arfkin wrote that the cover was probably overweight, more than a half ounce up to one ounce, which as a ship letter required eight cents postage, three cents more than the value of the envelope stamp. They suggested that the Mount Sterling Post Office had made a simple mistake in applying a two cent postage due adhesive. My opinion, based on the appearance that someone attempted to erase the due to three cents short paid endorsement, is that the Mount Sterling postmaster interpreted it as a foreign letter prepaid at the five cent per half ounce letter rate, but he wrongly believed that the recipient had to pay the two cent ship fee. There was no fee for an advertised letter. To my knowledge, this is the earliest mail piece struck with the red two-line ship letter Navassa Island, West Indies postmark. There must have been enough mail to justify manufacture of the postmarker, but today examples are rare. Another aspect that interests me is that the sender, George Washington Tipton, was then superintendent of the guano mining station at Navassa writing to his elderly uncle, Ninus Preston Tipton, probably a birthday or a Christmas greeting. N.P. Tipton was born December 2, 1809. Five domestic letter rate reduction to two cents per ounce, the ship letter rate became four cents per ounce. This cover reflects a prepaid example of that usage. It was probably brought to the United States from Navassa on Duncan's Bark Romance, but by mistake missed the mail dispatched July 16, 1888 at Baltimore. So it was deposited at the Milford, Connecticut post office on August 12, en route to the August 19 arrival of Romance at New York City. 
George Tipton sent this letter to his brother French Tipton at Richmond, Kentucky. A back stamp shows that it arrived August 14. French Tipton edited and published the Richmond Climax daily newspaper. The August 15 issue ran the snippet I copied here, which must have reflected the contents of the letter. Captain George W. Tipton, who has been sojourning on the island of Navassa, West Indies for a number of years, will reach home in September and remain here permanently. He recently shipped a $12,000 cargo of phosphates to England. As events transpired, Tipton returned to Navassa. He resumed his position shortly after a brief trip home to Kentucky. His title, Captain, reflected Tipton's service in John Hunt Morgan's Confederate Cavalry Regiment. He was captured in Ohio during Morgan's July 1863 raid and was held prisoner at Camp Douglas in Chicago until the end of the war. This cover went as an unpaid ship letter from Navassa aboard Duncan's Bark Romance to Baltimore where it entered the mail on December 22, 1888. It arrived that same day at Wilmington, Delaware, where four cents postage due was collected from the addressee. Thomas N. Foster, the Navassa Phosphate Company bookkeeper at the Guano Mine, sent it to his mother, probably with a Christmas greeting enclosed. Over with the red Navassa postal marking. Its current location, if it still exists, has not been made public. This picture shows how it appeared when Stanley Ashbrook illustrated it in the January 1943 American Philatelist, credited to Vernon L. Ardiff, who owned it. The letter arrived July 16, 1888 at Baltimore on the Bark Romance. It was backstamped July 18 at Richmond. It was prepaid two cents, half the ship letter rate, with the balance collected as postage due. Passenger aboard the southbound Pacific Mail Steamship Company liner Colon posted this one cent Liberty Head postal card near Lavassa, an obvious misheard phonetic corruption of Navassa in late July 1876 for transport by the northbound Atlas Line steamship Alps to Southbury, Connecticut. Upon arrival August 4 at New York, it was treated as an unpaid ship letter from a foreign country, rated five cents postage due on delivery. United States postage due stamps did not yet exist in 1876. At present, this is the earliest recorded mail piece from Navassa. In mid-1873, the Atlas Steamship Company of Kingston, Jamaica, inaugurated regular Atlas mail line service between New York City and ports in Haiti. From 1874 or 1875 until 1898, Navassa Island served as Atlas Liner's transfer hub for international mail from Haiti to the United States. Southbound steamships carried mail from New York to Haiti. They collected mail from Haiti and dropped it off at Navassa. Northbound liners picked up the Haitian mail at Navassa and took it to New York. The Navassa relay system operated in just one direction from Haiti to the United States, and only until 1898. In its time, it was a significant innovation. A February 23, 1876 article in the New York Herald included an interview with the purser of the Atlas steamship Alps, which had arrived at New York the previous night. It included a cameo view of the postal procedure. The Haitian mail was brought on board from Navassa at half past one o'clock in the morning of the 16th by a sailor. No Haitian newspapers were handed to me. As a rule, Mr. Davidson, the superintendent of the Guano Works, comes on board and tells me all that is transpiring. 
but as it was night when we arrived, he did not care, I suppose, to come off and board us. The Port-au-Prince mail crosses the island of Haiti in about 15 hours. The Republic of Haiti became a member of the Universal Postal Union on July 1, 1881, which thenceforth allowed the prepayment of postage on international mail with the postage stamps of Haiti. And stamps issued in 1881 and 1882 were Haiti's first. Haitian stamps were denominated in Saint-Yam de Gourde, hundreds of a gourd, abbreviated Saint, which I am going to pronounce in English as cents. Under terms of the UPU convention, Haitian foreign letter charges consisted of five cents postage plus five cents surtax per 15 grams of weight for a total foreign single letter rate of 10 cents. Postcard charges were two cents postage plus one cent surtax, total foreign postcard rate, three cents. On this card, a three cent Liberty Head stamp of 1882 paid the foreign postcard rate. Canceled at Port-au-Prince on September 4, 1886, it was collected by the southbound Atlas liner Athos and dropped off at Navassa. The northbound Atlas liner Alvina collected it at Navassa and delivered it to the New York City Post Office on September 13. Expedited transport in which mail was handed off by one ship and collected by another at a location with no post office, no official representative of a sovereign government, and no wharf where ocean liners could dock, resembles whalers' use of mail drops on islands in the South Seas during the Moby Dick era, but adapted to the age of ocean steam navigation. Endorsed steamer Andes via Navassa, New York, San Francisco. This cover was posted to the purser of the Atlas Liner Andes at Jacques Mel on August 26, 1891, and he dropped it off at Navassa. Two cents, seven cent, and one cent coat of arms stamps of 1891 paid the single foreign letter rate. The northbound liner Adirondack collected it at Navassa on September 1 or 2. It arrived at New York on September 6, where the stamps were struck by New York foreign mail cancellations. Back stamps show the New York Transit September 6 and San Francisco September 12, 1891. From San Francisco, it probably left aboard the steamer Mariposa which departed September 18, reached Auckland, New Zealand on October 9, and arrived at Sydney, Australia on October 14. The steamer Berksgate departed Sydney on October 15 and took about 10, 10 or 11 days to reach Numia, New Caledonia. Mail from Haiti to Europe followed the same relay system at Navassa Island as letters to the United States. The New York City Post Office served as a transit point, redirecting mail to the next transatlantic steamship scheduled to depart for the destination country. On this cover, seven cent, two cent, and one cent coat of arms stamps of 1892, canceled at Port au Prince on December 7, 1896, paid the single foreign letter rate. Although endorsed per Royal Mail, it was collected by southbound liner Adirondack on December 9 or 10 and dropped off at Navassa. From there, the northbound liner Allegheny collected it on December 10 or 11. It transited New York and departed on December 15 on the North German Lloyd steamer Spray. It was back stamped at Bremen on December 25 for onward rail transport to Leipzig. One and a half years later, the Navassa Island Postal Relay ended. On April 25, 1898, the United States declared war on Spain. On May 13, 1898, a U.S. Navy warship had evacuated everyone from Navassa, debarking them at Key West, never to return. 
no one remained to transfer letters from Haiti to the United States. In his book, The Great Guano Rush, historian Jimmy M. Skaggs wrote, no guano shipment from American appurtenances officially passed through any U.S. port after 1898. Navassa, still an American possession despite ongoing Haitian claims to the contrary, was mined longer and more extensively than any other rock, island, or key that ever appertained to the United States. That ended the postal innovation that had relayed mail from Haiti to, through, and beyond the United States for 22 or 23 years. It also ended the transport of mail from Navassa Island to East Coast ports as ship letters. The disappearance of Navassa Island mails coincided with the acquisition of new American overseas possessions, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippine Islands, and American Samoa. Mails to and from those islands required new systems. In 1916, the U.S. Lighthouse Service built and operated a lighthouse on Navassa Island. During World War II, U.S. Navy and Coast Guard reconnaissance and rescue teams occupied Navassa. The Coast Guard decommissioned the lighthouse in 1996. Today, Navassa Island is uninhabited, administered by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Here is a list of my articles about Navassa Island, a subject so sparsely mentioned in print that my Lynn Stamp News report is the most extensive social, economic, political, and military history of the island, not just postal history, published in the English language. Even so, I have corrected mistakes and presented previously unpublished information in today's presentation. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Ken, uh, for that very informative and detailed uh, session. Uh, my question, I have one for myself. Uh, what got you interested? Can you have such varied and interesting research uh, interests what, got, what first got you interested in exploring Navassa Island for research and for writing? Well, I've actually researched and written about uh, several obscure United States overseas possessions uh, before this one, uh, notably Wake Island, Midway Island, and uh, Swan Island in the Caribbean. Uh, Swan Island is no longer a United States possession, <clears throat> but uh, this was kind of a natural unfolding. I, I actually have envied this ever since I corresponded with Vern Ardiff in the 1970s, but I never thought that I would have the opportunity to to own these. Uh, the And I became the beneficiary of each of the of the philatelic scholars who preceded me, beginning with Vern Ardiff, and then uh, as Scott Treppel uh, reminded us of, of Scott Gallagher, who uh, uh, whose interest was guano. That was his topical subject of collecting. And then uh, more recently, John Krupnik. Uh, and uh, so I benefited from all their research plus the uh the potential today to to uh, learn so much online that was unavailable to them uh and uh but it, it's a great story you know the when when scott gallagher first submitted one of his the the first cover he got from navassa the philatelic foundation certified it as a fake uh, and just his adventure in getting it, in proving that it was genuine uh, and publishing that story in the Classics Chronicle, uh, you, it couldn't help but pique your interest if you're, if you're interested in, in uh, the romance of philately and postal history and in uh, uh, paradises and uh, 
and well, this was far from a paradise. It was more like a hell. But but uh, uh, you know what I'm saying. That that is a, of uh, far flung places that uh, not very many people have have been to or even know about. And uh, so that's where it began. But as I say, I never thought I would have the opportunity to own these. And and when it came my way, I couldn't resist. That leads into another question I had. Such an amazing uh, collection of covers and Navassa, Navassa covers and Navassa related covers. How difficult is it to find Navassa colors, covers, and are they very rare, difficult to find? You saw all five covers that are known to exist. If the if the one that was last seen in 1946 still exists, which it might not have, a lot of Vern Artis' collection was lost in a flood. Uh, uh, Scott Treppel has refused to sell me his, so I'm I have the three covers and the one uh, postal card that uh, uh, from a, a different sort of thing. I, I'm the one who figured out the the uh, Haitian connection and acquired those. Uh, more recently, uh, during World War II, and this is something I wrote about in my Lynn's article, but is well beyond the classic era, but certainly is innovative. Uh, it's one of the few places in the world ever where airmail was, uh, was conducted by blimp, by uh, uh, by uh, lighter than aircraft that w uh, the, when the when the navy and the coast guard garrison there wanted to send mail, the the navy blimp would lower a line and and uh, with a mail bag of the incoming mail and and pick up the outgoing mail and and uh, fly it either to Guantanamo Bay or to uh, uh, to Key West. And I have a few of those covers. Those are excruciatingly rare. Uh, and I have the only known piece uh, between the end of, of, uh, of the guano mining and the beginning of World War II, which is, which is a QSL postcard from the Coast Guard Lighthouse uh, radio technician uh, on uh, uh, Navassa Island uh, that was picked up by the by the uh, Coast Guard supply ship in 1926 and and carried to the so for every period uh, it's rare and and I I define rare uh, strictly to mean fewer than ten. Uh, uh, there's there is no other collection. Right. A couple of our other attendees, a few of our other attendees have asked whether you've ever been there or would like to go there. Uh, would I like to go there? Uh, sure. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's not easy to get there uh, and it's not easy to get permission. Uh, and as I said in my presentation, Really, it should not be owned by the United States. It's, it should be owned by Haiti, and Haiti has never abandoned its claim. And and uh, in the in 1981, they they actually landed a, a crew of radio amateurs there to uh, to claim it as their country. And and uh, the American military uh, garrison there uh, politely. Uh, stood aside while they while they raised their flag and so on, but then ushered them out. Uh, so right now, uh, the the only people who are allowed on those islands, besides government officials in charge of of them, now that the lighthouse is no longer in service, are are just uh, uh, scientific teams uh, investigating. Uh, you know, biological and geological features. But uh, despite all that, uh, the Haitians have never given up. And, and so Haitian fishermen and, and uh, beachcombers go there all the time. 
So this partly answers this other question that one of our attendees has. It still is considered a U.S. possession, correct? Yes, yes. It has been ever since 1859. And the tragedy of it is, as a, as a consequence of a murder case there, this is, a, this is an endless, you couldn't make this stuff up. It's such a great story. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the black uh, miners in an insurgency in, in the 1880s, uh, took over, killed some of the, of the uh, managers and, and were eventually taken to Baltimore and, and put on trial and convicted. And uh, in their appeal to the United States Supreme Court, part of their claim was that the court didn't have jurisdiction because the island really belongs to Haiti. And the, uh, the, the upshot of it was that the U.S. Supreme Court issued a decision that said it didn't matter whether Buchanan told the truth or not. The court had no, uh, no ability to investigate the truth of his claim. It had to accept that the president's claim was valid. And that precedent has applied ever since to every U.S. claim overseas and more recently underseas, that is, to the continental shelf claims. I'm curious, you talk about the Haitian connection. Were Haitian stamps ever allowed to be used as postage from Navassa Island, just U.S. stamps? No, ju just U.S. postage and, and uh, so little of that you wouldn't know it. And of course, during World War II, the, the irony of that blimp mail is that, is that uh, although the air mail rate for uh, military personnel was six cents per half ounce overseas, uh, uh, surface mail was free, but there was no surface uh, transportation from Navassa. So the free mail uh, from Navassa went by air, by blimp to the United States. Right. Uh, you had a nice slide there at the end. I'm sort of the librarian in me speaking now of some of the resources that you used. If someone were to do research about Navassa Island, are there others besides the ones you listed there? Well, those are my articles. And, and uh, uh, well, the Skaggs book that I quoted uh, is, is probably the uh, the best place to start. But really, if you don't read French, you're in trouble. Uh, that's that's where most of my uh, uh, sources from after the Haitian Revolution and before then, as you saw, the Spanish and, and Italian and, and, Eng and early Old English sources are the only ones. Uh, the other thing I will mention too is, uh, since uh, uh, Ken reminded me of this uh, earlier, uh, we have uh, on our on the the symposium registration page, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, we have Ken's exhibit on Navassa Island. And I really encourage you to sort of check that out. It gives you a lot a lot of the details that you saw today with additional information as well. So if you're really curious about uh, Navassa Island and some of the postal history that Ken explained here, I would check that exhibit out as well. It's really a worthwhile thing to do. Um, another question I had uh, was uh, about uh, uh, the rates and, and the routes. You mentioned what kind of delivery times were you looking at when, say, something was coming from the U.S. to Navassa Island or vice versa? Was You showed that one cover that someone was sending it back to the United States. How long would something like that take at that time, in, that, in this period? Well, of course, if, if you mean the, the ones that were were brought by sailing ships, uh, that was that was indefinite. Uh, even even that letter that in in Scott Treppel's cover, uh, it, it was a fluke that that the uh, the the captain of the of the ship that was loading guano sent the letter by another passing ship that happened to reach Baltimore or. or uh, uh, Wilmington before he did, uh, but it, it, it was just the luck of the draw. It was whenever uh, w whenever a ship was loaded fully and whatever the weather uh, prevailed uh, that allowed them to get through. But uh, once, one, assuming clear weather uh, in 
in uh, not icy uh, or windy conditions, um, but enough wind to propel the ship. Uh, it could get get to the southern ports probably in five days, and the and the uh, the Atlas steamers uh, with handing the the uh, the um, relay mail from Haiti uh, advertised their service uh, as getting from Haiti to Navassa, from Navassa to New York in 10 days, which was which was otherwise far faster than they could than a sender in Haiti could normally expect by waiting until there was a ship bound for New York or uh, for Europe or or whatever. Uh, now, a, lo a lot of mail, of course, did go on those direct ships if it, when when they were available, but there they weren't there weren't a lot of them. And uh, I I wrote in my in my Chronicle article that I think that probably the relay the mail relay system was negotiated uh, partly to assuage the the Haitian government's uh, demand for the return of the island and and uh, the the US uh, consul there uh, I I believe was the one who said look we can help your businessmen uh, get their mail to the markets uh, if if you back off and and let us set this up and then they negotiated it with the British uh, Atlas line to do it and they did it then uh, reliably uh, until 1898 so it was uh, it, it was a, a good arrangement it, you know for for the theme of of innovation even though uh, it finally came to an end with with nothing left to represent it it certainly was a uh, a benefit to everybody who used it uh, during the 1870s to the 1890s. You mentioned that the island is basically more or less deserted now. Is there any mail that goes through there anymore? No, no, no. there hasn't been in in many many years. the 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 uh, the coast guard ships that served to uh, uh, fuel and so forth the the lighthouse uh, there there was one coast guard ship that did have a cancel in the 1960s with with uh Navassa Island and the killer bars when when it landed there uh and that's the last uh, uh, actual US mail or any kind of mail uh that was posted from Navassa since then the, these radio amateurs go there. They have their their uh, QSL cards, but they can't mail them from there. They have to wait until they get home to mail them. Right. Uh, one question from uh, one of our attendees: uh, To your knowledge, has there ever been an application to at the international courts to resolve the Haitian claim? I, to, not to my knowledge, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Uh, I. There's there's a long history of this, and and uh, all of, all of, uh, four of us researchers who have pursued this have gotten uh, successive releases from the National Archives, although the, the they've been closed since last March, so we haven't been able to get anything more. Uh, but the U.S. did an awful lot of diplomatic maneuvering to to either postpone or prevent uh, international arbitration of the claim. Uh, and, and some Haitian governments have preferred not to, to uh, press the claim. And that has, over the years, strengthened the United States claim. But there are still uh, important scholars in Haiti who continue to argue that this is not over. Right. And by the way, uh, Swan Island is a pretty good precedent to say that when, when political conditions change, that can change. The US was planning to keep Swan Island forever, but now uh, it, 
uh, it's gone back to Honduras. So, you know, uh, the never say never. That's a good example. It's a good example to you. I, I think with that question, we will conclude this session of the 2020 Postal History Symposium. For all of those, uh, those of you joining us for this session, we want to thank you for your attendance and ask that you join us on behalf of the 2020 Postal History Symposium, the American Philatelic Society, the American Philatelic Research Library, the National Postal Museum, and the United States Philatelic Classics Society in thanking Ken.